Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It's uh, great to see an uh, almost full crowd here. Um, it's amazing to see uh, this great turnout because obviously uh, you feel as strongly about downtown South Bend as we do. And um, we really want to hear over the next weeks and months a lot of the ideas that you have. And so tonight, though, we wanted to bring somebody to kind of launch this. Somebody who's kind of been here before and has done that and has kind of been on the ground uh, in a place called Durham, North Carolina. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have a fan in the front row. Uh, Casey, her name's Casey Steiner. She brings her own fan club, I guess. But, so tonight we're thrilled to have Casey Steiner, a founder of Finding Next and the current executive director of Made in Durham, a workforce uh, development organization in Durham, North Carolina. Casey is a national expert in urban innovation strategies, and tonight she will tell the story of how Durham, uh, North Carolina, downtown, uh, was revived through place-based efforts. Casey brings valuable on-the-ground experience in uh, urban innovation strategies to help downtowns realize their full potential. Casey? Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having me this evening here in South Bend. I will tell you a quick story that um, it, South Bend plays a very special part in my life. Um, I married my high school sweetheart back in 1978, and we had 36 incredible years together until he passed away here not a couple of years ago. But our very last trip that he wanted to take uh, with me uh, to commemorate our life together was South Bend, India. I know you laugh at he was a die-hard Notre Dame fan. Uh, he also happened to be a big Indianapolis Colts fan, so we had to do the Colts as well. Uh, but it was a great, great, great trip. And sorry to say I haven't been back in many years, but it was fun walking around your downtown today and getting a sense of all the great things that are doing uh, that are going on here. Uh, I want to set a couple of things first before we get started. Uh, and that is that you are embarking, South Bend is embarking on a new master plan for its downtown. Uh, you heard earlier uh, what all that's going to take and how you should get involved, but please understand, I'm not here to talk to you about zoning. I'm not here to talk to you about how many parking spaces or how all that works. That's their problem. <laughs> I'm here to help you all as a community understand why it's really important that you get involved in this process that you, that you ask a lot of questions and that you engage in what your community can be. Because I'm going to do a little bit in the beginning here, I'm going to do a little bit of information around um, you know, community work and why community work matters, um, why, well, a little bit of background, um, but I'm going to do a lot of storytelling. I'm going to, get a, going to tell you the story of Durham, North Carolina, and you're going to be surprised if you don't know Durham, North Carolina, how incredibly similar it is, or it was, quite frankly, uh, back uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago to South Bend, Indiana. And then I'm going to tell you what I refer to as our awesomes and oops, um, well, all the things that we did in that process that really worked, and all those things that oof, maybe we shouldn't have done that and would suggest you don't do that uh, moving forward, or things you could do, um, quite frankly, that we didn't do that would have made uh, our downtown a lot better. Um, you should also know that these guys hired me at their risk because I tell the truth. So when you ask questions, and we're going to have time for questions, I'm going to be real. I'm going to be real. I'm going to share with you my experiences, what it looks like, what it didn't look like. Answer questions as best as I possibly can um, around your particular project or your particular concerns about your project. But that's what I want you to do here tonight. We're going to talk a little bit, and then I'm going to have a Q&A. However, I'm not one of those people that has to talk forever. Um, if I say something, in this presentation, during the course of the presentation, that really either bothered you or excites you or you just need to understand better, raise your hand. I will take a question during this conversation. I don't want you to lose that thought uh, in the moment. That's really important. But at the end, we will have Q&A, we'll have conversations, we'll talk about some stuff, and we'll kind of go from there. Any questions about the project? We got the great team itself in the room tonight that can kind of help guide you on all the what's next. Uh, parts of it. So with that, let's get started. So a little bit of background. 
Why communities and why downtowns matter? I do think it's important that we put this context to it before we start talking about the story of downtowns, right? Um, I want you to understand <clears throat> that one of the single biggest issues in the United States today is our inability for businesses in our communities to find workers. Uh, we cannot find workers. I do, in, I do, in my consulting business, I do, one of the things I do, I get hired to do a lot, is interviews with business and community leaders. I was telling the team here, I've already done 294 of them in 2024 uh, across the United States in eight different states. And this is all I hear. We can't find people to work. We can't find people to work. We can't find people to work. Now, one of the reasons you need to know that is the case is that we're just diminishing as a, as a country in terms of our population. And what's happening is the baby bucks. I don't know if you know this, but we've actually been below our replacement rate since 1972. So since 1972, we haven't been actually replacing ourselves uh, across the United States. Second of all, our life expectancy, sorry, everyone in the room here, me included, our life expectancy has actually been decreasing. We are down to 76 now, as you can see, much less than UK, Canada, other, uh, organs, other uh, countries around the world, along with the fact that most of us that are aging are aging out earlier and quitting the workforce work quicker. We're leaving quicker than our, our parents used to. And find our, we oftentimes fulfilled that gap with immigration. Immigration, we have not come close to our immigration number in the last seven years. I know that sounds weird, but it is the truth. We have, so all of this combines to show that we have this incredible talent development, talent retention, talent attraction, which drives our economies, allows our companies to be successful, allows us to be successful as employees, is hit an all-time low, and it just keeps getting lower and lower and lower. Number one issue, I hear. Number one issue, find me workers, find me workers. You should also know that this really the whole rules around talent and how you can be a where you can work and how you can work has changed pretty, pretty dramatically since COVID. So that complicates all of this as well. So understanding that talent really is important for our community to, su to succeed, why? <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about why that matters for your community. Talent right now, because it's a shortage, has choices. You can decide who you want to work for and where you want to live. You can decide the job and you can decide the community. And that's what's happening. Um, and what happens um, with this, by the way, is communities are now starting to understand that. Economic development organizations, cities like South Bend, oh my gosh, we're in a talent war. We have to figure out how to make sure if our economy is going to continue to grow, we have the people here that can actually grow it. And so when talent has choices and how they can actually decide where to go, they need more than statistics. They need, okay, I'm looking at a job, I'm leading, more, I look through that, your community through this very personal lens. Is this a place I wanna live? Is this a place I wanna stay? When they are here, when your kids are here, when they're growing up, when the students are here, is this a place I wanna stay in, I wanna live in? And it, when they make the decision to take a job, it gives them comfort to know this is also a place I could live in and prosper in and be part of and be included in, right? This is important to them. So they're, they're looking at it through that lens. So the issue here, ladies and gentlemen, is talent and workforce is driving our national economy right now. And the solution is people in place. And more important, it's connecting people in place. People have to come to a place they feel connected to. And they're making that decision over and over and over again right now. So understand that lens before you start thinking about your community and your downtown master plan and what needs to happen. So, it's, why, so why, is your, why is your downtown important? I like to tell everybody, because I, again, I do this a lot, your downtown is your city's living room. When people come to your house, they walk in, you come on, you know it, you're in there half in the kitchen, they're half in the living room, they're checking out the house, deciding who you are, looking at the pictures on the wall, doing the whole thing. People are doing the same thing in your downtown every day. You just don't know it. It's just your living room. And, and it says a lot about who you are and what you value. Who you are and what you value. Remember that. When you start thinking about your master plan, when you start thinking about all the pieces of it, what you want to see of it, what you want to engage in with it, it's who you are and what you value. And that's, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, why you have to get involved. Because all of your what I want and what I value matter. 
uh, in this community. Mm -hmm. Connecting people in place matters. Getting involved, involved in designing your city's living room really matters. Mm -hmm. It really, really matters. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, I, I sh probably should have picked a better picture than a lot of people drinking, but um, <laughs> in my world, that's kind of normal. <laughs> so let's start with, um, and it's, I know as you sit in your seats today, I know as you started to read all of this today, the first thing that goes through your head is, oh God, what, how, is, how is all of this possible? Like making a downtown robust and making a round, downtown uh, can, can have all of the values and things that I like and new people would like. How do, we, how do we do that? That's really hard. It feels intimidating, right? You look at your downtown and it feels intimidating. So one of the things I do is I love to tell the story of Durham, North Carolina, because the story of Dur Durham, North Carolina, we, are, we were way far behind where you are right now. You've made a lot of strides in your downtown. There's still a lot of things you want to do, a lot of things that you could be doing. But in Durham, North Carolina, uh, if you don't know, Durham, North Carolina is part of the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill region, that's most well known for Duke University, right? Um, uh, so, uh, it, and it's, it's part of the Research Triangle Park. So, but before I get into that, let me just say to you, you're not the only ones doing this right now. There's just a few pictures of cities that I've been in, uh, in throughout this state, in other states, to this size, larger, smaller, and with all incredibly different attributes uh, around it. It doesn't matter whether you're Ashland, Ohio, which has maybe 20,000 people at it, uh, in it. Um, it's one of my favorite downtowns in the whole wide world. I can still go to the penny store, the penny <laughs> candy store. I love that place. Um, it's really, really cool. What, it do, what everyone here is focusing on, though, is how do, we, how do we provide opportunities for people to see us as a community, but also to see each other and connect people. In Durham, we coined the phrase um, uh, eventually, we coined the phrase. By the way, you'll learn through this process that many times we had no clue what we were doing, right? But we tried a few things and we figured it out along the way and then we iterated and iterated and changed it and, and, and added things, we, we pulled back things as a result of learning this process and what it is that we do. But one of the things um, I think that uh, we learned really, really early on that I will leave you with today to think about as you move forward today, if I leave you with nothing, your downtown, in addition to all the things it needs to have, stores and businesses and residences, it has to have what we refer to as places that, that, um, that inspire um, collisions. Mm -hmm. Inspire collisions. Places where people who would not normally get the opportunity to meet, meet. Not, not even half the time, not even by design. Mm -hmm. uh, and unintentional. But in the next thing you know, you're connecting, you're mm -hmm. commuting. You're engaging in this space. Oh, in Durham, there's very little, there's very little space that's not like free space, like uh, lawn space or you know uh, park space that isn't specifically looked through the lens of what intentional collision can I make happen? Here? Mm -hmm. And that's very, very, very much by design. And you can see what I love about all these communities is that they've done that. They figured out all kinds of ways to actually make people, like for instance, when I'm in Ash Ashland, which is this place right here, you see that butter butterfly, the angel wings on the wall? My grandkids, by the way, um, I have grandkids all over the United States. I'm Irish Catholic. Um, so I have three daughters, and one in Ohio, one in Indiana, uh, and one in uh, Florida. Uh, so I often bring them together at one of my kids' house, and we go downtown exploring. Yes, I'm that grandma. Uh, that makes them do that. And we stand in line to get pictures in front of those. So you can stand in front of it and be the, the wings are behind you to get pictures. You, I can't even tell you the people I've met standing in line waiting to take their picture with the angels. And we get talking and we find out who they are. Why are you here? What are you doing? It is really, really important to, again, connection is how people determine whether or not they're going to stay here and be part of it. So everyone around the U.S. is doing this right now. Everyone is doing it. How do we make our community a welcoming community, a community that connects people um, and shows the community who we are and what we value? Okay, really important to move forward. But let's talk about the story of Durham. Look, does this look a, 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 similar to any of you? This is downtown Durham. <laughs> we could be looking at downtown South Bend, couldn't we? Um, we could be looking at downtown Fort Wayne. 
right? There's a lot of ways, uh, this is actually half of it, and this is actually, believe it or not, and not even uh, a current uh, picture. I just love this picture so much, I refuse to change that. Um, and I'm going to tell you the story of Durham and, and all the phases we went through and what happened and what was successful and why it made a lot of sense for us. Um, but before I do that, I want to make you understand that there's a lot we have in common. We were both built on manufacturing. So Ben was built on manufacturing decades ago. Durham, North Carolina was. We were one of the cigarette capitals of the world. Not so great in 2024, right? Uh, we, has, we have, when we started this project uh, a couple of years ago, we had two and a half million square feet of empty, abandoned trees growing up through the ceiling. I, I tell everybody, well, we just started in rooftop gardens, just did it from the bottom up, that's all. <laughs> Um, we had two million square feet of that kind of uh, location, or that kind of facilities in Durham when we started this. We were not a, oh, let's just make Durham pretty. We were a mess. We were really a mess. Uh, we struggled through that decline. Best thing that ever happened to us, though, is we were so poor, we couldn't afford to tear down all those buildings. So they stayed. And eventually, we were able to re 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 renovate them and replace them uh, as really economic engine engines for Durham. We rebuilt our economy. It's like you all rebuilt your economy after uh, the manufacturing um, changed up significantly. And we both have premier universities in our community, um, which need to play a big role uh, in who we are and what it is we do. Need to play a big role. So. That's our commonalities. So I'm going to tell you the Durham story. By the way, this is the America the Backlund campus. Um, this uh, was Lucky Strike. Who, uh, all you uh, elderly, older uh, uh, yeah, people in the audience know Lucky Strike. Uh, the other one manufactured in downtown Durham with Chesterfield cigarettes were the other one. Um, so we have both have, we're, uh, were able to preserve the Lucky Strike manufacturing facility and uh, the Chesterfield uh, manufacturing facility. Both renovated in totally different things, but are both there. I want you to know it's 25 years in the making. This did not happen, oh, we're gonna do a master plan, it's done tomorrow. There was uh, there were three phases of this, but it, but it happened over a 25 year period. And then I'm gonna share with you a lot along the way about why it really mattered, how it changed who we are and what it is that we do uh, as part of it. So again, as I say, we were tobacco and textile, we were one of three uh, Black Wall Streets across the United States uh, back in the day. Um, and uh, we eventually became part of the Research Triangle Park. Right now, the Research Triangle Park is in Durham County. It's not in Durham City. But 80% of the park is actually located in Durham, right? That park didn't get started until the 1960s, 50s, 60s, right? Didn't actually start to develop and build until the 70s, well into the 70s. So uh, about that time, we started in the 1980s, we started the decline of tobacco and textiles. If you would have walked into this building right here, this is the one I just showed you the picture of a minute ago. That was the building, right? One of the buildings right there. If you walked into that building in 1983-ish, um, you would have, it was eerie, really, really eerie. It's the tobacco company at one day decided they were closing their doors. And that was it. It looked like everyone got up from their desk and went home for the night and never came back. Mm. Vases, cups, papers, everywhere. And it sat like that for 17 years. Mm. 17 years. And I'll tell you how it got started in a, in a minute, but it sat empty. Look at it. When I say trees were great, the only people using that facility when someone actually bought it and renovated were the police and the fire police and fire to practice, uh, to practice fire retention related activities and to do uh, uh, drills with the, the police department. Um, so no one else was actually using it. <clears throat> uh, during the time of tobacco decline, the regional growth emphasis of the Research Triangle Park started to grow. That made it even worse because no one really cared about downtown anymore. We're going to squat the park, right? So every, the park, if you've never been in the park, it's an amazing park. It's the it's largest uh, a park uh, in the research park in the United States, second largest in the world. Of course, China had to build one bigger about 10 years ago. Um, it's huge, huge facilities it's, uh, all over. It's, it's, it's over two counties, uh, Wake and Durham. Wake is where Raleigh, if you read about Raleigh, so that's Wake. Durham is uh, Durham County. 
Um, and it started, it began to grow, and it created its own campus. So it's a research campus that's thousands of acres, right? In Durham County, but not down, not anywhere near downtown, in the far end of the county. That started to grow, and, to, and that then led to the major decline of the downtown. This is in the southern half uh, of downtown, okay? Southern half of downtown, oh, right there in Durham. So here's what I like to tell you. I'm going to show you the evolution of the city. <clears throat> the, uh, from 1993 to 2004, we like to say what was done was why people finally decided to do something was because no one else would. There's actually a great video, if you want to go online and look because no one else would, is the story of how the American Tobacco Campus got built and done. It's a great story, and that's what it's called, because no one else would. Uh, the second, and that was very organic, and I'll tell you that story why, and you'll understand that in a little bit. The second half was 2005 to 2015, and we went, hey, this is working, maybe we should do this. Hmm. So first is, nobody else would, maybe we should, right? We got real busy in 2005 creating a new economy in our downtown. Um, and it, it became very opportunistic. Like we took advantage of every opportunity we could. And then finally, once we really got this, uh, got this going, um, I say because, damn, we were too good, we had to get very intentional because we never, you're going to hear me say this all day long, never in a million years believed it would happen. We had no plan for success. No plan for success whatsoever. We just were chugging along. We're going to make this plan work. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to, we woke up in 2016 and we went, oh my God, where are we, what are we going to do? Um, how we got all, we have all these things. We, we were so good at this. Um, that we had to get really intentional about increasing residential, et cetera, et cetera, that you'll see when I tell this story. But it, you can see it happened over that long period of time. I'm going to spend a little more time than normal on this story, um, because this is where it all started, the first two, and then I'll kind of go really fast through the other ones. But again, raise your hand if you have a question, you want me to be a little more explicit. So <laughs> I wish... I wish I, w I, had the, I had the honor one time of sitting um, and facilitating a conversation between Jim Goodman and Mayor Bell. Jim Goodman was the man that is currently the man that owns the Durham Bulls team. Okay? He also owns the American Tobacco, also owns the American Underground, which you're going to hear about here. His, his company owns that. Um, and Mayor Bell, at the time, was the county commissioner who eventually became the mayor. And they tell the story from two totally different lenses of what happened and how this, but it started, this project started the Renaissance. The Durham Bulls back then, in, in the 1990s, was still a single A league. It was exactly what you saw on the movies, right? The Bull Durham movie, filmed in Durham, uh, was about the Durham Bulls. It's exactly what it was like. Jim Goodman owned a capital broadcasting company in Raleigh. But it had, and his, his territory was a larger territory. And when he looked at his territory, the only place that was non-performing was Durham. Non-performing was Durham. Like, what's going on in Durham? I'm not getting any business out of Durham. We've got to do something here. Uh, so his philosophy was, he did some research, and his philosophy was, listen, when you're in the broadcasting business, you can grow your business two ways. Number one, you can grow your market, uh, or you can grow your area, or you can make every piece of your market better. Right? So he said, my worst piece is Durham. I got to go do something in Durham. So he comes down to Durham. He sees the Durham Bull Stadium, which, by the way, is still standing today. It's really cool, uh, in downtown. Uh, we preserve it because we value that. It's important to us. Um, so it's still standing. It's really cool. But he looked out. He said, this is kind of crazy. I want to make it bigger, better, do some things. I'm going to create this sports park uh, in, in between Raleigh and Durham. And I'm going to, that first one is going to be the Durham Bulls, and I'm going to build them a new uh, place. So he goes and he meets with the owner of the Bulls, a guy, another little guy, great guy, owned the Bulls, and says, I want to buy it. Can, will you sell it to me? He says, he said, he, uh, at first he didn't say that. I'd take a bar. He said, look, I got this new park I'm doing. I want you to be the first one down there. I'll build you a new stadium. You bring the team down. He says, okay. Mayor Bell, who's then Commissioner Bell, hears about this, says, no way. You're taking the Durham Bulls out of Durham. Ain't happening. So they get into this argument, this conversation about what it is that they can do, and they offer to build him a brand new stadium downtown. And I will 
leave out a lot of the funny parts of that story and just say that he, ex he changed his mind at a meeting and decided he would take the city, county's offer, city's offer, and he would go ahead and build that stadium. Now, I want you to, the one part I should say to you is this is important. When they decided that they were gonna build that stadium, they went out and put it out on, for a bond referendum. They were gonna spend all this money and build a stadium. That bond referendum got killed 90% no. 90% no, okay? The county did. And then the, the then county commissioner, Bill Bell, went over to the county and said, we can't lose this. You're, you can do it through your bond referendum program. Let's put it on your bond referendum program and you build them a new stadium downtown, which they agreed to do. Three of the, county, three of the city council people that voted yes to do that were unelected the next year. No one admits to being against this stadium now. Um, and what happened was they agreed to build the stadium, so Jim, Jim decided, well, I'm gonna, uh, if that's the case, I'm just going to buy the cult. So he bought the club from this, this gentleman, and he now owns this club. This stadium, looking like what you're looking at is a recent, well, not recent picture, actually. It's a couple years old. Um, but that stadium has been up over 25 years. It's breathtakingly beautiful. They just did a $20 million bond referendum to update it, and Jim Goodman, the owner, put $12 million into that stadium. He doesn't even own it just to participate in it because we really like it. It was really, really important to um, the other parts of the city. When Jim built it, he decided there none of these buildings were there. None of this existed. He said, well, what the heck? Maybe I could be a real estate developer. Maybe I can use all that land. I can put some stuff there and put some property in there and build some stuff. So that's what he did. And it's it, much to everyone's surprise, people loved it. I said, yeah, I'll go to that. I'll, I'll put my office in there. That's a really good thing. Let's go do that. So that, that's called Diamond View 1, 2, and 3. There's three buildings that wrap around uh, the park um, that were not there. But now Jim's sitting there and he's got, I got this nice park, I got these three buildings, and I'm looking at that mess across the street. A million square feet, a tobacco warehouse with trees growing out through it, and all my people are coming into, the t into town, they're enjoying the ball game, then they're getting their, put right back in their car and they're going home. They're going home. So they're not staying, uh, not doing anything in downtown. So what they decide to do is, if we're going to be able to do that, um, if we're going to do this, we got to figure out what to do in that building. Now, many, there have been many, many, many uh, offers to do something in that building, and Jim just decided he really needed to do something uh, and give it a try. So in 2000, he went and he made an offer to the city. By the way, this is what it looks like right now, um, just so you know. Um, it's, over two, it's over about a million and a half square feet between uh, all of the buildings. It's... It has apartments, it has retail, it has commercial, it has bars, it has restaurants, it has, uh, and Duke uh, as well, it has, so it has education in it as well. A phenomenal, beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, facility at American Tobacco. Um, and that opened in 2004. <laughs> so let me just tell you how it happened. It's 1.2 million square feet, and the original key partners in 2024 were Capital Co Broadcasting, Duke University, GSK, and McKinney. Um, and what that happened, and, and what became the way we did this uh, moving forward, how we did downtown development moving forward is, um, the main developer, in this case, Capital Broadcasting, would go to key players in the community and say, for me to get financing to do this project, I need tenants guaranteed. Mm -hmm. I need tenants guaranteed. Duke, you gotta guarantee me. 30% of the square footage that you're going to rent from me. GSK, which by the way is Glasgow Smith Klein, major drug uh, development company in the park, who were also very um, involved in downtown, involved in Durham. You got to guarantee me X amount of percentage of the square footage. He the, he would go back and he would get key players to guarantee him to becoming a tenant for X amount of years at X amount of rates to get the project off the ground and get it moving. Bank then financed it. They got its construction. They started it. Everyone else raised their hand and said, I want to be part of it once they saw it. Today, it's, it's, uh, like I said, it's a 1.2 million square feet. It actually, in addition to all those things, also has a uh, technology co-working space. It has a PBS television station, radio station. It has a YMCA and has a high school uh, located on, on the, an event space on this. Today, you could walk in there. You'd see Oracle, Apple, Google, Duke, Burt's Bees uh, all in there. Um, by the way, none of which other than uh, other than Duke, <laughs> was here uh, before, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, but they all want to be part of this space, and all, all want to be part of this vibe. Now, you can see what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> if you look at those chairs up there, 
All of this, by the way, all of this are just pieces of what you can find on American tobacco. Um, those chairs are in the middle of a grassy knoll, no bigger than this spot right here, no bigger than this spot, um, in between a building, uh, an old coal shed that they turned into a YMCA basketball court, uh, outdoor basketball court right behind it. Um, and then it funnels down into the main part of the campus. And so they made it all grass. And it was cool for a while, right? And then they say, you know, it's kind of wasted. It's just sitting here with grass. So they turned this small piece of it into a hammock park. There's hammocks. Come hang out, lay in a hammock. They changed this piece into tables and chairs. You just pull up the table, chair, talk, eat, do something. And they changed this piece into a life-size chess set that you could just go and play chess for. And there's not a day where people aren't out there meeting other people, talking to other people, intentional collisions. It's very much about what we do is about intentional uh, collisions. Um, the last thing I want to say on this, and by the way, this is really cool. So Burt's Peace um, uh, took a large man piece of the manufacturing building um, there for one of their offices. Um, this is their east, uh, U.S. East Coast uh, headquarters. And they're located here. And a couple of years ago, uh, Bert, the original Bert, um, passed away. And Bert Spies, with Capital Broadcasting, went up to Vermont, where he lived in the woods, and bought his hut that he lived in. And tore it apart, piece by piece, brought it back, and put it on the campus in front of their building. And now that becomes a place where people, you can see the people over here, all come and hang out, want to see it, and be part of it. Again, anything that we can do to just, and again, our value. We value history. We value where we came from. We value um, you know, the environment. Whatever it may be, um, but that's what we do uh, in Durham now. <clears throat> so when we started that, this process, when we finished this process of the park and of ATC, we knew, we started to say, okay, we're starting to understand what we value. We value innovation, we value revitalization, and we value diversity. These were three things that we came to a conclusion of in this process that we really valued. So then we started to say to ourselves, okay, in this next phase, we got to be more, a little more opportunistic about what those value propositions are, right, and how we do it moving forward. So again, I'm going to give you some context. Durham Bulls here, American Tobacco here. If you go to Durham Bulls here, Diamond View building here. On the other side of Diamond View, again, another empty lot. By the way, right behind us, the jail and the courthouse. Literally behind us, the jail and the courthouse. And the city said, OK, this is going so well. We're in 2005 now. The campus opened a year ago. It's really robust, going crazy. Well, let's build a performing arts center. We got this empty lot here, why not? Um, and no concern whatsoever that we were in front of a jail and a, and a, and a courthouse. They built this beautiful Durham Performing Arts Center. <clears throat> the story I want to tell you on the Durham Performing Arts Center is a story that's important to you. When they first decided to do this, it's a 2350-ish seat theater. Um, beautiful, well-known for its acoustics. It was really, really beautiful, but while they're building it, they decided, well, you know, we're spending a lot of money on this. City doesn't know what they're doing to run this. We'll contract with someone. And they just went out and got, they were going to enter into a contract with, I wish I could remember the name of the company, I can't, but um, really mediocre, like someone that just did events, um, not shows, events. We're going to contract with them. We're going to have them run this for us. And people like you sitting in the office said, excuse me, we just spent a boatload of money on this. And we know the community arts centers typically don't make money. They, they hopefully break even, because what they do is bring tons of people into town to eat and shop and do all, and stay overnight and do all those other things and create a lot of tax dollars in your community. So as long as it's not making money, it's good. But they said, this is kind of crazy. Why should we go in with that thought? Let's go figure out what it is that we need to do that's actually going to make this not only a phenomenal place, we actually maybe make some money while we're at it, right? What the heck? So what they did, well, and the community. You, it was the community ran right their hands like, no, we want, we want better than that for this. Um, because they were feeling good about where this was going. They were feeling their opinions were valued. They were feeling like they were engaging. American Tobacco Campus is a million two square feet. And if you ask anyone in Durham, they think it's public space. They, don't, they have no idea it's privately owned because it's always open to the public. 
So they decided they wanted that. So the city, to their credit, listened, went out, and hired two companies. They hired Niederlander um, to, to actually do the bookings for what would be there. And they have hired performance facility management company. At what, the Niederlander, by the way, has theaters on Broadway. Um, and performance facility management company is out of Rhode Island. They said, here, we're going to give you a fee that we can afford. We know it's a little less than what it is you want, but here's the deal we're going to give you. Well, after all the income comes in, all the expenses are paid, we'll split, we'll do profit share. We'll split the profits with you 50-50. You get 50% of the net we make, city will take 50% of the net we make. They said, okay, okay, that's an incentive. We can work our butts off a little bit harder to make some good money, we'll do this. The first year of operation, it put a million dollars into the city coffers. City share was a million. The year before, the year before COVID, it was seven million dollars. So this, <clears throat> it is the fifth ranked by Billboard magazine uh, most successful ticket, ticket sale venue, performing arts venue in the country, behind only New York and Las Vegas, Radio City, Golden Power, Hard Rock, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's amazing, and it's got diverse. You can't even I can't even begin to tell you the diverse talent that comes in there on a regular basis. Not we do get Broadway shows all the time, but we get concerts and school shows and just a whole bunch of stuff. It is, it is booked constantly. <laughs> and that uh, took off. That then, okay, we got Performing Arts Center, we got this great community, this downtown that's doing crazy in American Tobacco, all these visitors coming to see it, the ballpark. Maybe we ought to get involved in hotels. <laughs> we had one in downtown Durham, one in downtown Durham, a Marriott. Um, and uh, over the next couple of years, we built um, a bunch of them. This is 21C, which is, I always tell everyone, is actually an art boutique that happens to also be a hotel. It's full of this crazy art. Um, that is an old motel in the middle of downtown that they turned into a super cool hotel uh, in the middle of downtown. Upstairs, you can see that balcony area. They turned it into a swimming pool and uh, event space with uh, band space there. We, we love our art and our music in Durham. A lot, a lot of bands everywhere. This is one of only three... This was an original bank building in downtown that went under during all that bad times we have. Um, mid-century, this is one of only three mid-century bank, uh, bank buildings in the country, and there's tons of them, that was converted into a hotel. That's called the Durham. Um, as you can see, it has a hotel top bar and restaurant up there. Uh, super cool. I'll sh I think I'll show some pictures of it later. And then eventually, we actually built, see, this is Diamond View 1 that you saw in the first picture, that building there. Now we got the Durham Performing Arts Center here. What the heck? Let's put a hotel here. So this is an A-loft that's actually connected uh, between the two of them. All of those in downtown during 2005 and 2015. Very now, you know, we're, we're being really opportunistic. We got some real good things we can do, um, and we can kind of go, go from there. Um, to, uh, we also got restaurants, bars, and retail. These are just a bunch of quick, oh, by the way, this is the inside lobby area of the Durham Hotel. They call it Durham's living room. Um, so if you're in Durham and you're just hanging out, and you get to come hang out in the lobby and have a cup of coffee and do whatever you want. They have a lot of stuff that they do just in their lobby for Durham residents to do. Um, we have our own um, BU Cafe uh, with live music and entertainment every week, black owned. Black owned Duke grad, um, started his own business here. He runs a great thing there. Um, this gentleman right here is a James Beard finalist for mixology uh, in one of our bars in downtown uh, Durham. Um, this is how we, uh, every alleyway is used. There's never not, it's not used uh, in some fashion. And some uh, retail, as you can see. We take every, we take pride in every making, every cranny something uh, that you want to go explore and see and be part of. Again, this was going on in 25, 2015. We had to do this now to keep up with everything that was going on, right? We have all of this activity, all these people all of a sudden coming into town. What it is that we're, what it is that we can do to keep up with this? And the other thing that I really, really, really want to talk about now, too, is we also started to see that we started to keep get younger and younger people uh, into the community. Um, and uh, again, this was just, early on, it was just a feeling. It was just a conversation, seeing people, talking to people, doing those intentional collisions. And what we found was is that with all of the great things going on in American Tobacco, we were actually getting a lot of young people. And some of the th things in American Tobacco going on in the park, we have our first tenant in the park was IBM. 
you know, we have a lot of high level technology stuff out in the park. And a lot of uh, grads, Duke grads, UNC grads, North Carolina State grads, were saying, you know, I think I might want to get into the tech business. I want to be one of these entrepreneur tech startup companies. And Durham is cheap as hell. Let's just go get some space down in Durham, hang out in the coffee shop, and figure out if we can start a company. And that ended up creating, um, I can tell you a lot of stories on that one, lots of really, really, really fun things we did uh, to get that going. But to, um, we created now what's called the American Underground, and that was 30 days space for anybody that wanted to take it, uh, large, small, shared up conference rooms, all of that stuff to meet that demand. We worked specifically with Duke University on all of their graduates and engaged people, uh, told them all about the space, what it is they can do. You're still, and that's one of the conference rooms. That's upstairs on the rooftop. You can like hang out, and uh, we have event space up there to do. But also, again, uh, a little opportunistic. So we had two guys, two young guys in Durham. If you know, if you know, if you, when you get to know Durham or you go to Durham, you don't hear Durham. You hear Durham, D-U-R-M. That's how Pete, if you're if you're from Durham, what you say is Durham, right? And we had two young guys that said, you know. That sounds like a great brand opportunity. And they created this company called Runaway. And Runaway does created this Durham brand uh, of clothing, of all kinds of stuff like that. And it is now the standard in Durham. You, don't, it's, it, you won't walk down the street and not see someone in, uh, wearing something Durham, talking Durham, um, all of that kind of thing. And that really came from this whole thing of we're Durham. We may not be Raleigh, we may not be Chapel Hill. Um, it, it, we, we, are, we are really us, this is who we are. We're young, we're gritty, we're entrepreneurial. This is who we are, and so they came up with this brand, and it is now Durham's brand. Um, officially adopted by Durham, um, the city of Durham, everybody, of course we say the city of Durham, but Durham is what we use on everything it is that we do moving forward. Yes, sir? I think you're talking about Durham being a contagious city not an isolated city? Um, that's, I would say to you, yes and no. And here's, go ahead, finish. You want to finish, Tom? Okay. I like living here because we have five or six contagious cities mm -hmm. here. And when something happens in one of them, um, they get the bug mm -hmm. in another city. So a lot of people just zero in on one of the cities. Mm -hmm. like South Bend now is 100,000. <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, Mishawaka and Elkhart are identical, about 52,000 mm -hmm. each and so forth. But, um, so a lot of people come to see these areas just a small city, South Bend, a smaller one, Mishawaka, a mm -hmm. smaller one, Elkhart. But that's not it at all, mm -hmm. because we have contagious cities. Yep. So, the metropolitan statistical area population yep. here is 812,199. I like numbers. I'm impressed. I guess you do. <laughs> I'm impressed. So, yes, I think we have an advantage being full of contagious cities. Yep. So how do we compare with Omaha, Nebraska? Mm -hmm. Our metropolitan statistical area population, ours is 812,199. Theirs is 925,000, but I'd rather live here. <laughs> contagious cities are fun. Uh, contagious cities are really fun. Here's the other thing that contagious cities often do. Not always, but often do. We are a contagious city because we live in the triangle. Right. So we have, and we say this to people all the time, we have Raleigh, we have lots. We consider the research triangle 13 counties. But the three main counties, if you don't know, Research Triangle was built on not on the counties or the cities, it was built on the universities. It was the triangle between Duke, UNC, and NC State. That was what got it started originally. But Duke is New Durham, UNC is Chapel Hill, and NC State is Raleigh. Uh, and then there's all kinds of subdivisions. Uh, not, I'm sorry, uh, smaller communities, uh, little uh, communities around those larger cities. Yep, mm -hmm. well what I love about it, to the point he's making, which I think is an excellent point, what we found is, number one, we worked together, it took us a while, but we worked together incredibly well as a collaborative. Really well together. If you're in the economic development business, you learn that it's not a question of what city you pick. It's a question of what MSA talent pool you pick. 
The city is just where you find the right dirt or the right building, right? Because people move in and, in and around these. And what we found in it is that each of us, if you ask anybody in the triangle, each of us have our own, have our own culture, have our own thing. Durham is young and gritty and um, just entrepreneurial. Ch Chapel, Hill is, Chapel Hill is very much a college town. Really cool college campus, lots of things going on. Um, just really cool college town. You go to Raleigh, Raleigh's also this, in addition to NC State, which has its own uh, campus, Centennial Campus, that is built outside of downtown, it's so, getting so large. But it is actually a state capital. So you have the state capital there, um, and, uh, but you also have what we like to say all the time, you have a lot of corporate there. So you start in Durham, you grow in Durham, and you may end up in Raleigh. But what we say is you find a place in the drive, to the point you're making. It's the contagious stuff that goes on. If the region is that kind of region and that kind of fun and that kind of, has that kind of brand amongst them, it really makes your brand that much more unique and that much more saleable, we found, uh, in doing this. We have a really, really cooperative re relationship there. So that is Durham's brand. We're very much that right now. So what did we learn the second time around? Well, we learned, uh, we learned who our brand and our vibe was. You'll hear me use the term vibe a lot. When, when you ask people what you think about something, what they end up telling you isn't really, well, they're this, this, this. They start to tell you what they feel, right? It's a feeling. It's a vibe that you get when you're in a community. We're a very creative class. We're very talent recruitment and retention focused. And we're about ecosystems. Um, when we got into the entrepreneurial tech entrepreneurial world, we realized we had to create an ecosystem for that. That requires different things than other kinds of industries require. So we're very attuned to how we create in, in ecosystems. Yes, we knew we wanted to do revitalization, but we understood that sense of place as part of that revitalization was really important. We learned that live, work, learn, and play. Um, we add learn into this because we're a college <coughs> town, as you are. Learn is, should be engraved as part of our values. Um, we believe that we are the urban living room. Um, for downtown is the urban living room. It's where people come to understand, uh, to meet people and have a drink or something to eat and make friends. Walkability was really important that we did. So now these, these are just add-ons to values. Diversity, entrepreneurship, connectivity. We can absolutely say, how are we con connecting and including? Intentional collisions. We learned that terminology and we did it. So we just kept adding to our values. So every time we would look at another project or another piece of the plan, we just kept saying, does it do this? Or are we missing something? You know, that it, just because it's not part of this, it still could be and we're missing something. But we started to use those as our values. Then 2016, 2024, residential and mass life science technology, we've been discovered. Um, downtown Durham has Google, Meta, uh, Apple, they're all downtown. This, by the way, was the other Chesterfield building. <laughs> um, that is now a uh, life science entrepreneur. So people doing drug discovery uh, as young entrepreneurs are doing it in um, labs that are created specifically for uh, that work um, out of uh, Duke and uh, UNC. Um, these are uh, all buildings that, that was our first, how you like that, it was our first high rise uh, in Durham. Um, it was uh, commercial on the first floor, office space, WeWorks, all of that on the second, third floor, and then on all, all up except the top three are apartments, the top threes are condos. We never had a condo in downtown Durham until 2020. <laughs> that, 2019, that was our first condo uh, sale uh, in downtown Durham. Um, and so we get, we get a lot, a lot of that. Um, and when I say residential and mass and life science and technology and mass, it is definitely downtown right now. What that did for us, it added different kind of values. We have to continue to innovate and iterate, but don't lose ourselves in it. Don't lose ourselves in this, just because we're excited that Apple and Meta and Google are here. How is that part of our value system? Um, never thought about affordability. Oh hell, we're so successful now, no, we can't afford ourselves. No, that's what I'm talking about. Never planned the issue of affordability. That's a big problem for us right now. Now, diversification, all kinds of stuff. We just assumed we'd be in industry sectors that we were always in. 
right? We're seeing this incredible diversification going on. Um, access and opportunity. Mm. You know, when you start getting into this, you gotta be cognizant of making sure there's access and opportunity for everybody. Early on, that was easy because we were Durham, we were young and we were gritty and we didn't have much. But as we get more, we can't forget to not forget everybody else in Durham and make sure that we have access and opportunity and never lose focus of local. The one thing we've done really, 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 really well on local, um, in downtown Durham, I should be able to tell you, I think one of these slides will tell you how many restaurants we have. I can't remember. We have no chains. We have one chain, I take that back. We have a chain, a little chain in a building right next to the Durham Bulls, right? Nowhere else is there a chain restaurant in Durham, down to all locals. And we have hundreds, all locals. Durham has never lost its value on local, uh, on the restaurants. We could, do, we could do a little bit better on, on, on the retail uh, and business services side. And we know that, and we're working on it. But we, we are really, really good. Uh, and we decided, oh my gosh, we're being so successful. We, we didn't think we'd have to worry about local. It's only us. No one cares about us. We're in Durham. Trees are growing up through our ceiling. You don't have to worry about local. You do have to worry about affordability in local when you do these plans. Make sure the community gets to be part of it, your success, as the success actually grows. So some awesome news. Um, let me give you that and now. If you want to look at these numbers, I won't go through them all. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous numbers. When we started, there were 3,800 employees. There's now 17,500. When I say coming, these are all announcements that have been made. Announcements been made that the shovel's about to be in the ground. Number of those big problem for us moving forward because we didn't plan for success. But you can see how what it did for the town. It's a really vibrant, vibrant town. Um, people love coming to it. It's fun. It's got a little bit of everything in it, uh, and we've been incredibly uh, lucky uh, along the way. And, but also intelligent, uh, uh, intentional about it. We've had 2.23 billion investment uh, since 2000. I want to point out that 35% of that is public and 65% of it is private sector. It takes collaboration. Public-private partnership is a big thing. You'll hear from me as I wrap this up, um, as you see right there, public-private partnership. Um, when we did American Tobacco, I forgot to say, while that was a private sector development with private sector partners, the city and the county came in and said, we're going to take care of parking. Because in any development that size, got to have parking requirements, right? So the city and the county Took, did three parking ducks on campus that they owned um, and that served all the activities that were going on downtown and on, on campus and downtown um, to lift that for us. There's always a public-private partnership in Durham, everything it is we do. Um, we got really good at big vision of being bold and not caring. Like, let, what, what's, what, why, why would you not be bold? The reality of the situation is that in Durham back then, you couldn't get any worse. So let's go for it. Let's really go for it. What is it that we want to be if we're going to spend this money, let's spend it wisely on something that's really going to uh, make, move us for us. Authenticity was critically important. What I mean by that, we didn't try early on. I would say to you that we're, we're struggling with that right now. But early on, it was very authentic. Everything we did was part of Durham's fabric. We didn't try to be someone we weren't. We got bold in what we were good at or could be. Just needed a little help with. We very intentional, but with a sense of urgency, right? We never let it get it get off the burner. If people started to get you know mad about it or there was a problem with it, we'd like, okay, we got to go solve this. We're not going to put it on the back burner. We got to figure this out. Very intentional with a sense of urgency. Um, one of my friends, uh, who was the vice president of uh, Duke University. Um, and he was in, he brought, he runs a real estate for them worldwide. Um, they have campuses in China and places like that. Um, and he was essentially one of the architects of the, of the original Duke engaging in Durham on the real estate play. Um, he would say to people that we were, and, we, and they did it for 10, 12 years. They're doing different things now because we don't need their engagement in real estate play anymore. We don't need it. We got private sector people coming in and doing it all. But back then, we really needed them to play that role. Uh, now we need him to do different things, uh, which is what it is they're doing. But he always says it takes money, guts, and leadership. If just one of those is missing, it won't work. Money, guts, and leadership. 
Um, and I say that to you, there are people that lost elections because they voted for the city that we've become. Back then, people said, no way, we can't do it, I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it, and, and they lost their seat. But it takes money, guts, and leadership. Um, what we wish we knew, plan for success. You're really saying it 50 times. We never plan for success, never saw it coming. I, I've been getting that when I have to go in front of city council every once in a while, which I do every once in a while, I always do that. Okay, remember that part where I said we didn't plan for success? <laughs> okay, now we're paying the price. Here's what we need to do, right? So planning for success, I think, is really, we also didn't plan for change in leadership. This is an ongoing activity. You know, getting involved in this and being involved in this and really wanting to be part of it, it's really important because leadership changes. Um, your leadership at key institutions change, your elected leadership change, they change. And so making sure, this was a 25 year trip for us. For those people, it's not quite that long. <laughs> it took us a while to get it gone. Um, but for, to make sure that you don't lose leadership and partner roles. Um, making sure that ever, all the partners understood, okay, just you doing this one project doesn't get you off the hook. You gotta do four more. <laughs> in order to make this happen, right? So how we do it. Um, we have to learn, to, you have to learn, which we did not do, to broadly share the authenticity. And what I mean by that is, you know, we did not, uh, early on, when we were doing some of the things that we were doing, we didn't make, we weren't conscious enough to make sure that all of Durham understood that they could be part of this, right? That they couldn't, that they could be part of this. We learned that along the way. And we got better at it, but it definitely hampered some of our efforts later on and, or, and our success uh, later on because we did not share um, the authenticity, the engagement, and the success with everyone. Uh, that's a big thing for us now. We make sure that um, we say this all the time. Early on in this experience, we did not understand how important it was to ensure that all of Durham shared in the economic prosperity that was about to happen. We know that, we know that now. That's what makes a good community. And so we're way more intentional uh, about doing that than, than we were really, really, really early on. <coughs> By the way, that's our goal. If you haven't figured that out in the center of downtown. Uh, I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> okay, ask me questions, guys. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Okay, okay go. You, uh, you know what? You said a lot of stuff that was... Okay, here. Microphone. We want to try and record this as much as possible, people. Yes, you said a lot of stuff that was really uh, interesting to me. And one of the things that I liked was that living room concept, mm -hmm. that the heart of the city is the living room. Mm -hmm. uh, I never looked at it that way. Yeah. I thought that was great. And this Black Wall Street. Yep. That started in North Carolina? Yes, yes. Durham had a white Main Street and black Main Street. Mm -hmm. They were side by side with each other um, uh, uh, for many, many years and lived very equally but separately mm -hmm. um, uh, through, the, through about 1970s, 1980s. It's still there. It's still active uh, and very, but what, not what it was originally. And we are recognized in, as one of three major black Wall Streets in the United States. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And then the last one, I like the intentional collision, yeah. bringing people together. I'm a networker. Okay. And so that that was really interesting to me. Okay. Thank you. Yes. We have one here. Sorry. Thank you. When you started out, uh, is there any way you can show the first film that you had, the first picture? The first picture. Give me a sec. All the way from, all the way. Oh, no, not that one. All the way. Right there. Oh, that one. Go back. That one? No, go back. Oh. <laughs> more? One more back? To the people. That one? That one? Okay. You talk about diversity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Shutter's talk, it was the cheapest one. I no, it doesn't work. I said, uh, you talk about diversity, you have male and female, but you show no racial diversity there. Uh, yes, and you're right. Thank you for calling me out on that. Let me be very clear. Durham is and has no one majority race. We are a, a minority majority uh, uh, city, uh, and we are very proud of that. And she is right to call me out. Thank you. Thank you. Stay. 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 
You touched briefly, briefly on access and opportunity. Can you just touch on the role of public transportation with connectivity and providing additional access as far as downtown areas with the vitality and opportunities? Yeah, big issue for us, downtown uh, transportation all through Durham, but specifically in downtown. Now I'm gonna get myself in trouble. Where's Scott, is he still here? Where is he? He's still here. No? Okay. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Run out now. <laughs> Run out loud. So when I told you earlier that we use Duke heavily for um, uh, real estate, and I said their roles changed, for five years they paid for free transit around uh, downtown uh, because it would connect to their campus and then go beyond that and then come back and do that and do that. And that was a role they did so we could run the numbers to be able to justify to get the financial uh, federal funding that we needed to be able to run our round bus system. But we, we have had to add that. Um, it became very important. And I will say Notre Dame is a big supporter already. <laughs> so everything was great, but how do you guys work with uh, crime? Yeah. Crime is a big thing, mm -hmm. and homeless, mm -hmm. how do you guys tackle that? Sounds like your city was like South Bend at a time when it was, you know, no jobs, so mm -hmm. crimes got bigger, crimes got homeless bigger. became more, mm -hmm. and now we're trying to become better, but how do you guys work with homeless and uh, uh, crime? Yeah, that's really good. I would, say that, I would say to you that we don't do homeless any better than anyone else does right now. I think everyone's struggling with how to do the homeless population, and uh, Durham has some initiatives, but I wouldn't say they're round, resoundingly successful. Crime would go up and down and all around and in between. Um, we were terrible at the beginning of this. We got much better at it. Um, we got uh, post-COVID bad again. We have an organization called, uh, we have a black organization in Durham called Haytai, um, uh, and Haytai created uh, a new initiative called Haytai Reborn. Uh, and the nonprofit that you heard I work with with Maine and Durham, we partner with them um, and they work directly with the criminal justice system inside of Durham uh, to provide opportunities for uh, specifically crime related uh, individuals and gang members to be able to find uh, opportunities for uh, training initiatives um, and jobs in Durham. It's a very, uh, so it's been a program that's only been around for about three years uh, right now. Um, but doing incredibly, incredibly good work, uh, but not at a scale yet that I would say to you um, is making a huge dent in the crime. Crime is, crime is still an issue in Durham. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, it's still, it's still an issue in Durham. Um, very specifically crime among, crime against crime is where we're at right now, uh, but it's, it's real. It's a problem. I think that's what business owners would face. Yep. We are very proud of our bicycle infrastructure here. So what is it like oh, in Durham? Yeah, I didn't even bring that up. There's so much I can bring up on this and you only have a small amount of time. That's a great question. We are also very proud of it as well. Um, we have, a t uh, first of all, we have a 26 mile uh, American tobacco walking uh, <coughs> pathway that goes from Durham into towards Raleigh. Uh, you can go that whole way, which also allows bikes as well. Um, we have a very bike-friendly uh, city council, and most of our main thoroughfares in and around downtown have bike lanes. Um, and we've reduced parking lanes uh, to, to in uh, outside of downtown to allow for, not in downtown, but outside of downtown to allow for more bike lines as well. So we have a very, I would say to you, we have a very robust bike uh, plan and implementation uh, in Durham. And it includes downtown, but it's quite frankly, it's all in Durham. We can bikes from Niles, Michigan to South Bend, Mishawaka. Yeah. Almost all on the same path. Yep. Yep. We have some of that, um, but it's more individual community. That's one that the individual communities do more together than, um, than, than in other issues where we collaborate really well. Bike paths were much heavier, Durham's much heavier into bike paths than Chapel Hill and, and Raleigh. So we don't have as much, but what we've been able to do is get close. Oh, there. Durham does show up as a bike friendly city with the Duke of the American Bicyclists. You're also building some lanes that are dedicated to access lanes. Yep. There's uh, in the process of just establishing some lanes. Was that now 
part of the lack of planning for success. Absolutely. Was tri uh, cycling, transit, tran transit in general? Yes, 100%. I could give you a long list, but they were, they would top it. Uh, affordable housing is probably equally top, top, top of the list. Okay, I, have a, I appreciate the closing and your, your talk about, you know, not planning for success. And it seems to me like the, the issue is who is the success for? And, and so the success should be for the, the ones that need um, lifting um, and support the most in the community. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I had is how does this success impacted the public school system in Durham? And, just what what can impact that many No softballs to me tonight. That's for darn sure. Um, Durham Public Schools um, is still a very weak link for us. Um, so I have to go back just a second. Durham Public Schools, city schools, county schools, two different schools. City schools were black, county schools were white. We merged them together. Uh, all the white people back then um, decided to go to private school. Right, so it, we had all kinds of issues in that collaboration. Over time, we were able to work through some of those, um, but they still uh, basically are Durham Public Schools underperform um, compared to the state and national averages. We spend a lot, a lot, a lot, the nonprofit that I work with, we spend a lot, a lot of time in Durham Public Schools um, working towards some of those issues, but those issues, quite frankly, are way bigger than just the youth in schools. These are huge family issues uh, to the point you were making earlier, how you lift people up. We, there are a lot wholesale parts of Durham that can't afford to live in Durham anymore uh, as a result of all of the success. Again, we didn't plan for that. So, you know, there's some, there are some real issues with that. But Durham Public Schools are, are what do I want to say? Durham Public Schools are, aren't overperforming by any stretch of the imagination, but we have leadership at Durham Public Schools up until very recently. Um, that were really engaged uh, with uh, making sure that, that that changed. I should also tell you, in North Carolina, I'm not familiar with Indiana, but in North Carolina, Durham pub, or public schools are funded through the, the, the state funds them, but the local county has to match. So the school district has no tax authority. So the school district has to go to the county commissioners to get funding for the schools. So one of the things that we did very was put together a plan with the school district to work with the school district to get the funding that they needed from the county to be able to do the things that they needed to do on some of this stuff. So that inhibits just the structural way that schools are run in North Carolina inhibits uh, that in especially in urban areas. Especially in there. now, I will say this: in the New York Times uh, last week, there was an article that Harvard University did uh, looking at post-COVID improvement. Right, where we knew we had big learning loss during COVID, right? Um, and what they looked at every school district in the United States to look at how they were doing in, uh, in getting that back, right? Uh, in the United States. And Durham was literally mentioned in the article as being one of the best in the country of bringing it back up uh, to where it was. We had one of the largest increases there. So we're getting there, but we got work to do. Oh, two questions in this room. Back. I'm looking around here. We got. She has. Well, okay, the mic's over here. Mic's over here. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate is uh, a constant uh, thread in your presentation was talking about the community engagement into the visionary kind of structure yep. of where this the direction was going to go. You look at South Bend. There's a, com a lot of common characteristics in Durham. Uh, Durham. Um, what advice do you offer when you're kind of next chapter of this process is visionary boards and kind of looking at but what do you offer advice do you offer the community when we're talking about a balance of an homage of the history of the city versus what the city can be yeah yeah i do think the process that i understand it and talking to tim and the team that you're going through right now is a great process i congratulate each and every one of you for showing up tonight and actually wanting to hear about this and hoping that that's you're going to take that and move forward from it but i think what you have to do is you have to be very intentional about understanding who in your who all in your community needs to be represented in that conversation local businesses you know young adults um you know communities of color um, how, uh, you know, the universities, there's pieces of all this. So what I would, I strongly suggest people do is you do these, you get some good themes, right? You get some good themes that are coming out and then you do very specific focus groups and invite people to dive into that theme a little bit deeper. 
right? Rather than everybody be part of everything, right? So do a bunch of community groups, take a lot of notes, make note of who's really interested in bikes, like us, right? So if we're gonna make sure that we're multimodal and bikes are being included, oh, we have five people at this community event that really were into that. Let's, let's do them and some other people and train a focus group and go deeper and say, this is something we wanna explore more, help us explore. Okay, my name is Daryl McKinnon, I'm an Air Force veteran. I'd like to know what type of uh, support groups do you have? Four. Is that uh, AMVETS, BFW? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So you do have? Yes, sir, support? we do. Okay, all right. We do, absolutely. All right. Thanks. Veterans important in our community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm dating a veteran right now, is that right? <laughs> 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 Actually, it's my first, but now I'm just telling you know, someone to share with you. Like, I, if you haven't figured that out, oh, Casey holds nothing back. So, this is my first boyfriend since my husband passed away 12 years ago. Aww. And I picked a bet. I picked a bet. Congratulations. Thank you for that. Uh, I had a question. Where am I at? Over here. Uh, what are you doing to catch up on affordable housing? And what are you doing in a more granular way? Like, it seemed like it happened, but it didn't happen by magic. So yeah. what did the city do or whoever? Yeah, our city council, um, very important issue to them. Um, and so what we have done is, the uh, city has done very uh, well, is found plots of ground around the city that they own. Uh, for instance, we have a big new inter interactive bus station, right? And so they, that it was on a large piece of ground and they parceled off two pieces of that and, and uh, were able to uh, create affordable housing opportunities there. They put it out to bid, only affordable housing. They lay out the parameters and their definition of affordable housing. People come in, bid it, and they go from there. You'll see, we, we, you see more and more and more of that. I think the second thing the city does in terms of home ownership, it's really, really careful about what it does in neighborhoods to not disrupt um, neighborhoods, allow, um, allow, they, they do a lot to make sure that the people that need uh, assistance with fixing up their home get that assistance they need to fix up their home so it doesn't become a negative for uh, that kind of thing. Uh, we also have, to the point the gentleman was making earlier, we have a lot of nonprofits in Durham. We love our nonprofits in Durham. We have 4,700 registered nonprofits in Durham. Yeah, but, but um, several of them provide uh, all, all kinds of uh, affordable housing opportunities for you know, not just veterans, but for uh, people coming out of prison, uh, people coming out of drug addiction, all of those things. Each of them have a specialty, bought properties and neighborhoods with the assistance of the city and provide uh, housing uh, for them as well. So it's pretty diverse. I've got to tell you, it's barely hitting the number. It's not, every community I work in, every community I work in is, is dealing with affordable housing. It's just really, 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 really hard right now. But you got to be intentional about it. You got to put money into it. You got to know what's happening. You got to do what you can. You got to be aggressive. We got the mic over here. A mic over here. Yeah, it, my question kind of relates to that as well. Um, it, but goes beyond it. Gentrification. Mm -hmm. You've got you've got a nice, a lot of nice, really mm -hmm. pictures of gleaming buildings mm -hmm. and downtown. Uh, and I think we're experiencing here a real resentment about a downtown that. Where the money is going, and then the neighbor and neglect in the neighborhoods that surround it. And if you look at the the people involved, uh, even in this crowd here, uh, it does not represent really the entire city. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. when you build new, yep. you're going to price yourselves out. I didn't notice a huge increase in median income. Mm -hmm. It's only 52k, 52,000 today. No, it's 53,000. In 2020, I can't. Okay. Remember. It's a little bit higher. If I didn't change, I think that was my bad. Yeah, and it's so that you have. Higher. But it, the point, and you yeah, saying that. The point, in you saying that is that actually is the red flag for us. It's it's right. this weird okay. thing when you look at downtown That's and you look at the medium was this, and now the medium's this. You say to yourself, of course it's this. That's the only people that can afford to live downtown, right? If they're making this, so that to us is a red flag to say, okay, what are we doing to make sure that there is more diverse income? Uh, you know, uh, people with diverse incomes actually living downtown. Not everybody downtown making sixty, eighty thousand dollars. Well, I, I know guess that's nothing anyway, isn't it? Hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, so from that perspective, I think gentrification is a really big deal for us in in neighborhoods right now. I will say this to you, and I get the argument. I'm not going to argue 
uh, that community improvement is really important, right? Neighborhood improvement is really important. But having worked with cities and counties all of my life, I also know that to, for cities and counties to invest in neighborhoods, they have to have the real, they have to have the tax money to do that. And the biggest generators of tax are downtowns and industrial and commercial locations. So the more you can do to generate that tax revenue and put it in, put it into downtown and make that happen generates revenue to be able to be spent elsewhere. Otherwise, for them to do that, they have to raise, have to continually, you know, in, uh, raise the level of taxes and everything. Now, I'm saying that at a high level. Every community is different, right? But at a high level, that's typically what happens. Wait, wait, I, I'm sorry, I have to go with it. She has a question down here. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on that, just because some reflections you might have about, are there either in Durham some things you wish you would have done, or because you travel so much and you work with so many cities, yeah. some things that you think cities should do, one to three concrete things that private profit or not-for-profit or public sector could do, some kinds of programs to help ch challenge the interracial uh, wealth and intergenerational wealth gap. Mm -hmm. In your county, it's, I think, 74,000 mm -hmm. median house income, mm -hmm. 44,000 uh, for black families. Mm -hmm. And so what are some things we can begin to do now to build upon that uh, and learn from you guys. Oh my gosh, you know, now you're going, uh, this would be an hour for me to answer this call. This is my passion, it's why I work for the nonprofit organization I work for. So um, I think there's lots of opportunities. I think they, to the point that was made earlier, I think they begin in the schools. Um, I do think very strongly that, um, I can tell you that we have done an economic mobility study in Durham, and I can tell you that there are wholesale parts of Durham that have not participated in the economic prosperity that is Durham. And so what Made in Durham does is it, it looks at the education and career system in Durham for 14 to 25 year olds. And we look at every institution and every nonprofit that's playing in that space. And we identify where there's misalignment gaps and barriers to success at the end. Our job is to go in and fix that. So we go in and we identify them, we find them, we fix them as best as we can within the system. One that we're doing right now, for instance, our number one industry sector in, in, in uh, Durham is life science. Our number one industry sector in life science is biotechnology. Biotechnology, when the rest of the world is closing, <laughs> we added 8,000 new jobs in Durham during the turn COVID. It's, it's insane, the biomanufacturing that goes on there. What you don't know, and most people don't know if you're not in, in, that, in that space, most of our residents aren't in that space and don't know that, is that to work as a bio line technician in a biopharma entry level position requires nothing more than a community college certification um, to be able to start in a job that's $28 an hour. So what we did was we created, we looked into this. Why aren't they knowing that? Well, number one, they weren't aware of it. I told, there's a great line that one of our guys at the chamber uses all the time that says, people, so if you know Stranger Things, the, the show Stranger Things, they, they were written by two guys from Durham, graduated from Durham High School. And so we, the joke in Durham is, most people in Durham think the Research Triangle Park and you know, on life science is something that goes on in the, behind the trees in the forest back there, like Hawkins Lab and Stranger Things, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. There's no awareness of it whatsoever. There's no opportunity. Uh, these kids are, and I can give you a thousand stories. Um, so uh, these kids are working multiple jobs. They're, they're, they're you know, can't afford college, they, et cetera, et cetera. So what we do, uh, what we did was we worked with the community college and we created a program for specifically communities of color. Um, they, 18 to 25 years old, and I say 18 only because you have to be 18 to be in a biopharma floor because they have drugs in the building, so you have to be 18. Um, and we, pay, we put them through a certification program that we created in, in, with the technical community college. We provide success coaches, we provide the computers, we pay for the tuition, we pay for transportation, and we pay a $10,000 life stipend. So they can put some of their life on hold. These people are working two, three, $10 an hour jobs, just something, their life on hold, and go and get the certification. And then we have guaranteed job interviews on the back end uh, for this program. We put 150 kids, young adults, not kids, young adults, 18 to 25, uh, through this program already, out there making um, $28 an hour. I just was trying to get the statistics before I came here, how many have been promoted since then, because it's a, life science, especially biopharma manufacturing, is a great career pathway. None of them know that, none of them see it, they've never been exposed to it, can't afford it. So there's programs like that out there going on everywhere, but I would say to you, what you need to do is be very, uh, 
you, you need to be, you have to balance. You have to balance, how do I make my community affordable? But the same was, how do I make my people more successful so they have a hundred thousand dollar job, okay. right? So you don't, you don't want to just, oh, let's make everything, you know, this, so people can afford, no. <laughs> the idea here is to also get them over here and have opportunities. So again, for my advice to you, you got to do both at the same time. Yes. You got to think about affordable housing and what it is you're doing. You got to think about, you have to do the data analysis and understand what your community looks like, why it's doing, why, it's, why it is what it is. I can tell you what our, um, what our rates were 10 years ago. I can tell you what they are today and I can tell you what we aspire them to be 10 years from now. Because we've done that research and we put those in the ground and we want to be able to do that because, not just because of this, but just because Durham's a good community and loves doing that stuff and it's a lot easier to do. And we have 4,700 nonprofits, one of which will raise their hand and do it. So um, it's always good. Okay, what I'm concerned about is property taxes. Okay. Once this whole project takes place, mm -hmm. Well, let's just start with this whole library deal. Okay. My property taxes went up crazy. Okay. So once this project is completed, that's going to affect my property taxes. Mm -hmm. Now they have a relief, something that you get 2% only increase okay. over the next several years. Yep. But heck, they hit me so hard this past year. I'm thinking to myself, I'm all about growth. Yep. I'm all about change. All of this is wonderful. Mm -hmm. But how is it going to affect the people that own homes in this radius of downtown? And what, how big is this project? Yeah. I mean, I look at your pictures and I'm thinking, okay, that could affect homes that are yes, it did. in a 10, uh, what, three, four, 10 block radius. Yeah, I'd say 10 block radius. Yeah. So how is that going to affect folks that own homes mm -hmm. that have paid for years to own their homes. Mm -hmm. And now I see a lot of commercial will buy your home, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm sure that's part of this project. Yeah. You know, so I'm wondering how is that gonna affect people that own homes yeah. and our taxes? Yeah, that's a very legitimate question. So I, uh, oh, I, one more thing. Yeah, There's a Grow Your Community meeting on day after tomorrow. I tried to get in on that meeting and it's on a wait list. Okay, I'm so just looking, I'm, I'm just, really... do you know that one? Anybody? Okay. Is it ready to grow or something like that? Oh, I have it. Okay. I don't know that one, but oh, wait, back here. Oh, you would use one of the mic, or you want to answer that question? Yeah, we're oh, ready okay. to grow first community meeting, and it's downtown at the PBS building on uh, the 22nd. That's a, that's a network of child care providers. Okay. And so they'll, they meet on a monthly basis. They usually meet at the WNIT building. Okay. I think they're moving the location though because they had too many people. Uh, and child care is a huge issue right okay. now. Okay, thank you. So that is, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I, I can't, I, what I want to say to you is I can't answer that. It really goes from community to community and how it is you do that. Um, in Durham, we have a downtown business infrastructure district, BID, okay? A BID means the businesses downtown get charged extra. And they get charged extra because they got, they get extra, right? And so that's, that. and what I, what I mean by that is that that then creates more revenue in, from downtown businesses and more, less of a need to create more Ta higher taxes in these other communities. So that's just one where there's a zillion ways you can do a bunch of different ways you could do it, but it is an important issue. Because the last thing you want to do is gentrify your people outside of the neighborhoods around downtown because they've been what's keeping it up for a long time. Don't make don't make don't let that happen. Tim. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting connections between our two cities. Um, one big one was that they both had an industrial base yep. and they lost that. Yours was tobacco, yep. here it was automotive and manufacturing. I think one key difference is that um, your area also had this new emerging area, which was research. Yep. So you had a lot of people in what I saw your slide about the yep. creative class. Yep. Rigid Florida, yep. that whole thing about a certain type of people that really help an area grow because it's a very attractive, forward-looking type of, of population to have. Um, we don't have that same thing here. So we don't have that money that exists in the area, in the region, that you maybe want to migrate and bring down here. So in your work in other cities and going elsewhere, mm -hmm. 
what do we do if we want to have a great fun downtown, but we don't have the wealthy um, broadcaster who says, I want to buy this building yeah. and turn it into a cool complex that's going to bring people. So we have the chicken and egg thing. It's like we don't have enough people living downtown and we don't have enough cool businesses to bring people downtown. So yeah. you know, what do we do? So remember back when I told you and by the way, this is just one example. There's, it's not an easy answer. There's not one I can do, but there's things you can do. Remember I told you we had gotten the American Tobacco Campus off and running. It was just opened. It only been opened in 2004. So 2007-ish, um, 2004, 2005, 2007-ish, we started seeing, like I said, young entrepreneurs. When I say entrepreneurs, I'm talking about 21, 22-year-old kids that said I'm going to be the next you know, Apple, right? And they came to Durham and they found some space that was, you know, $2 a square foot and they put up a table and a laptop and they went to town with the internet, right? So when we started to see that and we decided that, you know, this was a real opportunity for Durham to actually invest in creating that creative class, right? You, I can't create the mega uh, developer, <laughs> yeah, gentleman, Mr. Good, although I wish I could, if I could, do a few of him, so it would be good. But you can look to create the, the, uh, what it is you're looking for. In our case, case, we're looking for a creative class. So what we did was, we did, we did a couple of things. We first, we went to Duke, and we asked Duke if they would give us um, a list of students that were in, that had graduated, that were in any kind of tech or finance, because we had FinTech, big FinTech piece too, um, that we could reach out to. Um, or they, that they would be willing to reach out to. And they said, uh, they had difficulty with being able to do that, but they came up with an alternative for us. They said, here's what you need to do. We've done a bunch of research, and here's what you need to do. You need to run, uh, back then, by the way, you could run Facebook, Facebook ads for like $25. You know, it was nothing. I have no idea what they are now. But back then, it was like $25. We ran Facebook ads to uh, between, for people between, uh, Durham and New York City um, that were graduates in a technology field or had on their Facebook post something related to technology and we ran ads about this new initiative we were going to do and calling Startup Stampede that we would say come try Durham for free for 60 days. <laughs> we know you're going to love it. Um, what's your alternative? Staying in your mother's basement for the rest of your life. So come try us. It was just a fun little kind of, we were inundated with requests um, uh, to engage in that process. And I will tell you, we went through, uh, we, we rented an old building that was empty downtown, the chamber did. Um, uh, we rented it for like $500. We went to the thrift store. I walked up the street with furniture and put it inside this old bank teller location and we started accepting applications. Um, the Chamber of Commerce did. We started accepting applications. Um, we got inundated with requests. We, we selected 12 for the first class. We brought them in, helped them build their business. We brought in two or three people that were successful entrepreneurs to talk to them, engage with them, do that kind of stuff. Surrounded them with the love that is Durham and what do you need? We'll connect you, we'll connect you, we'll connect you. Um, and they were there for a, a, couple, a couple of months um, and then they graduated and then we did another class and then we did another class. We put 36 people through, 36 entrepreneurs through that program. This was back in, I'm not lying to you, this was back in, uh, May, not even 2010. Um, and uh, 28 of them are still in downtown Durham. Still in downtown Durham. But that got us started. Hey, we can do something and we can do something different. So the next one, you're going to love this one. This was really a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so the uh, guy that helped us, put, uh, I hired a guy, a young guy, to help us put all that together. And when he got done putting all that together, and we did it, it was really successful, he said, hey, I got another idea. Now that this one's over, what do we do? And I said, okay, well, I better sit down and I got to hear this. He says, I think we should give away the world's smallest office. And we're going to call it the Smocks. <laughs> I'm like, okay. He goes, yeah, we're going to go. You, remember you saw the BU Cafe out there? Yeah. BU Cafe? Mm -hmm. We went to BU Cafe to have a 50 foot, 50, like this glass window with a little stage in the front at the time. And, um, it was where somebody would sit and play guitar or do something. So we went to them, 
and said, we want to give away this as an office. This square footage right here is no bigger than this in a window that went like this, right? Um, and, there, and there would be a desk right here and where we put, and, and they said, how they were very smart business people, they said, you can, as long as you build us a full blown stage in the back, we'll give you this. I said, okay. I said, we're going to need it for six months. So we put this program together uh, and we put it out again, just on social media and a bunch of stuff said, uh, we're giving away the world's smallest office. The concept here is that if you want to start a tech company in Durham, all you need is high speed internet, which Cafe has, a laptop, which we will provide for you, um, and connections to people that will help you build your business. And all you need to do is turn your chair around because BU Cafe pretty much was our downtown living room. That's where you went to hang out, have a meeting, do anything. Everybody that was anybody went there for coffee. They're all there. Go, go talk to them. Go do what it is you want to do. So we put it out and said, yeah, and give us a video, blah, blah, blah. And it was just a joke. Like, this will be fun, right? Let's go, let's go do this. And we did it. And uh, we got press like you would not believe. Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Uh, everybody picked it up, ran an article on it. We got ridiculous amounts of um, re responses. We selected one, who uh, three sisters, um, um, who had a tech company that resold makers, people who are making things. And after a while, you didn't get it sold and you wanted to sell them on discount and get it ready. They had a site that was just for that, went out and sold stuff and helped all the local make, uh, all the North Carolina makers resell stuff. It was really amazing. Um, and they, uh, we, uh, they sent an amazingly funny video in in which they worked out of their car trunk and said that the, the small office would be an improvement. Um, and they won it. Um, and we, uh, that got us so much press, it exploded our tech scene. So all of a sudden, we got that rep and people just started knocking on our door right and left. How do we do this? How do we do that? How do we do this? How do we do that? IBM actually paid for the whole thing. Um, we had IBM to pay for the whole thing because their thinking is it's tech talent. If they don't end up starting a business, they're going to come work for us. So let's do that. And they did that. The, I'll end with my favorite part is that we actually applied just because they were getting such great press. Uh, we applied to the World Chamber of Commerce Congress worldwide and won the world's most innovative economic development project in Doha, Qatar uh, in 2013. So, I tell you that to say you just have to be creative, know what it is you're, they'd be intentional about what it is you want. We knew we wanted tech creatives, right? So we went after creatives in a creative way. Um, and it turned out, and then once we got the community excited from there, the community supported it. It wasn't just us doing it. It became a big community effort. You go for one last one. There's somebody way in the back who's been waiting. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to be honest and hurt my heart when you said that you saw the green space and thought of it as wasted and quickly repurposed it. <laughs> so how did you incorporate natural elements yep. that are so good for people and planet? Yeah, the green space that we talked about was a small green space because we have a large green space in the middle of the American Tobacco Campus, which has become where we hold every major event. Um, it's, uh, that's why I say Durham thinks it's theirs. You can go there and I, that's literally, I'm not lying to you. Two years ago, I was walking through there and, uh, James Taylor was sitting there underneath the border tower strumming and I'm like, that James Taylor, like, <clears throat> so I found out later he was playing a deep hat across the street, just came over, sat on the lawn, started playing music. Everybody used it. Green space is really big in Durham. It, it is really, really important. We incorporate it into everything it is we can do. The biggest problem we have with green space is that we're, you know, our downtown is an old school downtown built environment already. Finding green space for it has been challenging. Finding green space for childcare downtown has been really challenging uh, for us uh, to be able to to be able to do that. So. We don't, uh, and, down, and overall, what's really important for us downtown, we took every, uh, every option we had, we took. We just didn't have a lot. Casey, I think we've covered a lot of topics tonight. Right? I do, right? Yeah, I mean.